You're listening to Economics Detective Radio. My guest today is Cornelius Christian, Assistant Professor of Economics at St. Francis Xavier University. Cornelius, welcome to Economics Detective Radio. Thank you for having me on. Today we'll be discussing some work Cornelius has done on the economics of violence. It's a difficult subject for economists, one we usually assume away with the assumption of well-defined property rights. Uh, So my first question to you, Cornelius, is why is it important for economists to study violence? That's a good question. I think that violence and conflict are ever-present human phenomenon, and they often have economic causes and consequences associated with them. Civil wars cost lots of damage, and they're very common phenomenon in the developing world. They cost lots of damage, both economic and in terms of destroying capital, both physical and human capital. Uh, It's very important to understand, therefore, the economic consequences of this Uh, violence, but it's also important to understand the economic causes and more specifically the economic mechanisms that lead up to this violence. If we understand the economic mechanisms, then we can act to prevent violence in the future. So your, your paper, Lynchings, Labor, and Cotton in the U.S. South, deals with violence against black people in the post Reconstruction South. Uh, Could you summarize your findings in that paper? Sure. So uh, to understand the paper, it helps to have a little bit of background on the history of this particular era. In the U.S. South at the time, after 1865, after the Civil War, about four million African-Americans had been freed from slavery. And things were good until 1877 when what was called Reconstruction ended. Uh, Reconstruction was this effort by the North specifically, to try to shape the South in uh, an image of, you know, its own design, basically one where African Americans were emancipated. Uh, You know, the Republican Party in the South enjoyed a lot of success at that time. But after the Compromise of 1877, that fell apart. And African Americans at this time were working in jobs in cotton plantations Uh, as, you know, uh, wage laborers, uh, some sharecroppers, and um, also they were working in competition with whites. Uh, Whites were working as wage laborers on these cotton plantations. So lynchings, I find, and this is an old finding, actually, that lynchings happen when cotton prices are low. When world cotton prices are low, more lynchings of African-Americans happen. The question is why? question is, what is the mechanism? That important thing I talked about previously. So I find evidence that this is consistent with a mechanism in which when cotton prices are low, labor markets are very, very tense. And whites lynch African Americans to scare other African Americans away from the labor market, therefore taking their jobs, taking their wages, etc. So how, how do you show this mechanism? Well, I do it in a number of ways. Uh, First of all, I show that when there are lynchings, there's more out-migration of African Americans away from a particular county where the lynchings happen. I also find that lynchings, once they do occur, there's an increase in agricultural wages, which is uh, consistent with this particular mechanism that I talked about. Okay. So, um... One objection uh, that I might raise is that there's sort of a, uh, I, I, I'm hesitant to say public goods because, of course, a lynching is a public bad, but there's a sort of uh, pu- like a public goods problem at play, wherein that if I'm a white uh, wage laborer in the South working on a cotton plantation, I am going to benefit from the higher wages after lynchings, whether I personally participate or not. So isn't there an incentive problem there that maybe people don't have an individual incentive? Absolutely. There is a collective action problem. Uh, That's common in any kind of violent phenomenon. That's common when we're talking about voting, too. Uh, 
I'm not explaining the collective action problem here. I'm explaining the mechanism. Uh, so I'm explaining what's actually happening. I mean, we know that lynchings occurred. We know that all kinds of violence occurred. Uh, what I'm trying to do is trying to explain the mechanism behind that. So why it happened in a particular time and place uh, rather than why it happened at all. Yeah, in a particular uh, type of setting. We can talk about the collective action problem. I think that's a separate question. But what I'm trying to explain is specifically the lynchings in question during this time, during the specific era, during this particular context. In a different context, lynchings might happen for different reasons, uh, which we'd have to look into more deeply to find out why. And we'd have to discover the mechanism in that particular context. It does seem like a, a very plausible story. I'm reminded of a story I heard about uh, Japan during the Great Depression, where uh, gangs of young Japanese men would go around beating up everyone with a Korean-sounding accent. So kind of similar story about there's a downturn, uh, times are bad, and and then there's an sort of obvious outgroup to blame it on. Yeah, I, I agree, actually. Um, you know, we often find, even actually during the uh, economic crisis, if you'll remember, as, as the uh, economies of several countries took a turn for the worse, there were more calls for uh, protection of uh, borders, protection against, uh, you know, uh, labor inflows, protection against uh, uh, migrants. You know, and that's kind of uh, even coming to the surface now when we start talking about these refugees and the, you know, the refugee crisis. So, you know, economic tensions, uh, yeah, they can bring out the worst in people. Right. And it's, I, I suppose it's, it's better that, that it brings out the worst in people in the voting booth rather than, uh, you know, in, in the streets uh, and uh, in actual violent acts. Definitely. Yeah, I agree. It, it is better that it's, it's expressed in a nonviolent way, whether that be in a nonviolent protest or in the voting booth, than in a, in a violent attack. Though, yeah, though, though it, is a, it is a glib and rather uh, dark uh, attitude, regardless of how it's expressed. So uh, I wonder if you could give a little bit more detail. How, how, do, you, how do you manage to... It must be hard to figure out what the labor... Uh, the wages were in a given county a hundred years ago or more. Is there good data available from that time? Yeah, the great thing about the United States in particular is that a lot of the data that's historical is available digitally. So, for example, to get census data, I need to go to this uh, website called IPOMS, which uh, lists international census data from various countries around the world. Their coverage of the United States is particularly good because uh, the Mormon church, in fact, um, actually enlisted the help of volunteers to uh, catalog and digitize the censuses going back since uh, 1790, I believe. So um, a lot of information that, you know, you'd have to normally go to an archive to to search for is available online if you're uh, interested in uh, economic history of the United States, uh, which is fantastic. Uh, you know, it's it's a fantastic thing about this particular area. Yes, because I, I would I would think that if uh, a black worker in 1890 moved from one area to another, that there wouldn't be much of a paper trail. Um, normally, no, that's right. Um, the data I use on outmigration is specifically from another paper, that paper that looks specifically on black outmigration from particular counties. And that data is by uh, Leah Bustan and her co-authors. Uh, and that's uh, the data that I use for my paper. And she actually, you know, uh, goes uh, deeply into the microcensus data to look at the movements of African-Americans. So uh, you, you have... Another, some other research in, the, in this area, in the economics of violence. For instance, uh, I saw you had a paper on economic shocks and unrest in French West Africa, mm -hmm. where you and your co-author, James Fenske, show a similar relationship between economic shocks and civil conflict in France's African colonies. Do you want to talk about that a little? 
Yeah, sure. I think what we're trying to do with this paper is quite interesting, actually. Uh, what we're trying to say is that economic shocks matter, but they matter within particular institutional and political contexts. So, for example, in French West Africa, the French made Africans that they had colonized pay, in, es in essence, a poll tax, uh, a, a tax that had to be paid to the French administrators each year. And that's, you know, what forced a lot of Africans to adopt agricultural practices so that they could actually export their goods, uh, pay a poll tax, uh, etc. Now, what we're saying is that when the, uh, when the weather and the temperature and uh, all of these other conditions are particularly bad, and that affects the crop, that, ex uh, that affects the harvest, or, you know, if the world price of a particular commodity is particular bad, is particularly bad, excuse me, in that case, you know, you're not going to be able to pay the poll tax, or it's going to be very, very difficult for you to pay, pay the poll tax. So you're more likely to engage in civil unrest during times when, you know, temperature is particularly high and your crops are just going to get burnt, when there's less rainfall for your crops, or when world commodity prices for your crops are particularly low. Um, although we do note a few exceptions. For example, palm oil uh, is one exception. That's because palm oil is also used in the diets of French West Africans. And so, you know, a high price could mean also a food shock. Anyway, the point is that shocks matter during French colonial times because of this particular institution of a, of a tax, of a poll tax, in essence. In modern day French Africa, we don't find that these shocks matter. In modern day French, Af Fr French West Africa, these countries are generally much more democratic. They're much more liberal than, uh, of course, a colony. And so anytime you tend to see an episode of unrest in these particular countries, it generally revolves around issues such as public utilities or students or universities or access to education. It doesn't revolve around agricultural issues per se. So that's what we're showing in this particular paper, that shocks, economic shocks matter for conflict for violence in different scenarios, in different contexts. There's a famous hypothesis in development economics that since institutions have a sort of stickiness to them, they tend to persist that, and I think this paper is more in doubt now than it was when it first came out, but the idea was that in places where there were high death rates of European settlers, they set up one sort of institution where they were, they sort of set up a puppet government and had a, Asa Moglu and Robinson call it extractive institutions, whereas where they had lower death rates, mm. they would set up more of a place where they would like to live and, and send uh, migrants there, places like Canada. So I guess uh, your story in French... West Africa is that there was institutional change. There were these institutions that led to violence under a certain set of conditions. But since independence, since the mid 20th century, those institutions have changed. And is there, is there a considerably less violence now? Um, well, I want to make something clear. AJR's paper, Ashmal Johnson and Robinson's paper, um, as you, as you say, exactly says that, that, you know, in places where the death rates of settlers are high, uh, all you want to do is just take, a, take all of the resources and run away. You don't want to settle there. You don't want to colonize there. You don't want to build institutions there. In areas where the death rate is low, like Canada, um, yeah, you want to send people to settle there. You want uh, to send people to explore the land, to build up colonies, to build up institutions. Uh, and that's why that kind of carries on today. I, I will say that we don't try to contradict AJR in this article because, of course, the level of quality of institutions in French West Africa compared to the quality of institutions in, say, uh, North America, like uh, the United States and Canada, for example, is, is quite different. So what we do say, however, we do say that, that unrest, the character of unrest has changed in, insofar as uh, back then, you have this oppressive poll tax, which farmers were forced to pay to the French colonial government. And if they don't have the income to pay this tax, then they engage in riots, they engage in protests, 
and they engage in sometimes an even outright revolution. Nowadays, the character of unrest in French West Africa is quite different so that you don't have that same kind of response. Generally, you know, the issues and the confrontations that result in violence or any kind of conflict uh, tend to stem from issues of public utilities and uh, access to education and access to various other types of public goods that these people feel that their governments aren't providing. So, I mean, it's interesting. Uh, wh- one of the things that you've established is that it was, in fact, taxes that were a big part of mm-hmm. up unrest against colonial governments. It you, One might think that, for instance, that people were interested in just being free or being uh, having their own political representation just for its own sake. I think in a lot of our sort of historical myths, we like we like to think that in all independence movements are sort of self justified because independence is a good thing. Yeah, but people need an economic motivation to uh, to risk their lives in uprisings or or in uh, political violence. Yeah, what are the general causes of of political violence? Can we draw general stories from from your research? Actually, I think the general story that you can draw here is that you have to look at the particular context and institutions before you can actually look at the types of, uh, of, before you can actually try to understand what's generating the type of political violence uh, and the consequences of it. You know, as, as we showed here that you know, here it really depends on the farmers being able to access income that they can use to pay a poll tax. If the temperature is too hot or the rainfall is too low or the prices on world markets that the farmers are getting are too low, then they're uh, more likely to riot. And in the, in the modern day, in, in contemporary French West Africa from today, from 1997 to 2011, that's the data that we look at for modern French West Africa. We, we don't see that same kind of response. I think the lesson, the general broad lesson to draw here is that shocks can lead to conflict, but you have to try to understand the mechanism and the context behind the shock. What's driving this? What's, what's going on here? Um, with re- regard to the, I guess the sort of philosophical question is, you know, like, do, should people just be free, but, you know, on account of the fact that we are uh, free human beings and, and we have the right to self-governance. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I can't disagree with that. But, um, uh, you know, definitely economic shocks can move things along I- in that direction. Um, for uh, You know, there are papers looking at, for example, the Mexican Revolution and showing that the Mexican Revolution was more uh, there was a greater chance of insurgency during the Mexican Revolution in areas where there was less rainfall, for example. And that actually leads to the, the Mexican Revolution. The, the variation in the levels of insurgency lead to variations in political institutions today in Mexico. There's, a, there's sort of a push and a pull to, to engage in political violence. And, and the, uh, the, the push would be something like, you just don't have a lot under the current system. So whatever the, n- this new system that you hope to create, you have more to gain. So I, I guess the story I'm hearing is that you have some kind of economic shock, you're dirt poor, you don't have a lot to live for, and so you're willing to take big risks to institute large-scale changes. Yeah, that's absolutely right. There's a paper by uh, Bruckner and Ciccione in Econometrica, which kind of shows, it's called Rainfall in the Democratic Window of Opportunity, I believe, if I haven't misquote, misquoted the title. And what they show is that when there's low rainfall, when there's a, a shock you know, to rainfall, as they call it, there's a greater chance for a political transition to democracy to take place. Uh, as you say, people are willing to take the risk, you know, because the opportunity cost now is low of taking that risk. They're willing to take the risk to overturn the current system and to institute a more free uh, system. Well, that's interesting because how, how broad a, a data set could they have? Do they, 
do they go all the way back to the democracy in ancient Athens, or is that this uh, modern independence movements in the 20th century? No, they don't. They look at contemporary uh, modern day uh, modern day Africa. Uh, actually, just they just look at Africa. Uh, yeah, they just that their data set is restricted to uh, sub-Saharan Africa, I believe. So most of the government transitions would be from something to democracy during the period then. So it, it might, might it be that it's, it's just the transition that is more likely or is it, or is it definitely the transition to democracy? Cause I can imagine uh, an economic shock causing people to revolt and, and put up a dictatorship in some other time and place other than the modern era when democracy is the, the, I guess, popular thing. Yeah, I think uh, democracy, I mean, if if the movement is, you know, particularly inter- interested in the median voter, let's call that person, if the if the if this movement or for change is interested in the median voter, it just makes sense rationally to institute a, a system of democracy. Actually, um, Ajumoglu and Robinson showed this in their model in, uh, it was, I believe it was a 2001 paper called a theory of political transitions. And what Bruckner and Ciccioni are essentially doing is trying to confirm that paper with empirical evidence. Uh, the reason they chose Africa, modern day Africa, is because Africa is still largely an agricultural economy that depends upon rainfall for uh, GDP and for various other things. And, and the nice thing about rainfall is it's what we economists call exogenous, right? It's basically, uh, it comes from from God, if you like, it, it's not something that can be determined by humans entirely. So um, it gives you a, a way to approach causality in that particular uh, case. Right. So that would be preferable to say, just looking for economic shocks, which could themselves be caused by government and what form of government you have and what sort of policies they're enacting. Which, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Which would create a problem of Maybe maybe people just revolt when their government is particularly bad. We don't know that it's uh, and and that the bad government causes the bad economy, but the bad economy doesn't necessarily cause the revolt. But the rainfall yeah. makes it very clear: rainfall is not caused by bad governance, but it does cause, uh, or low rainfall causes low crop yields in general. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Is there a, I I suppose there's a, the other issue with African economic data, of course, is that, uh, is that it's much easier to get data on, on rainfall than on GDP because the data collection in sub-Saharan Africa is not, is not what it is in, in -hmm. North America or in the developed world. So are there, are there difficulties with using Africa in that way? I don't think so. I think actually the growth in African data and even in African economic historical data has been quite large over the past decade. Uh, the London School of Economics, just to give you an idea, used to run, uh, it still runs this uh, conference on African economic history. And, uh, you know, maybe 10 years ago or when they first started this conference, there were hardly any, uh, you know, uh, papers that uh, were being presented at this conference. And now there's hundreds of papers at this conference. So, um, you know, that's because uh, researchers have gone back into the archives. They've managed to gather data from colonial archives. They've managed to gather anthropological data, which, for example, um, there's very good anthropological data now that shows the uh, I mean, you know, good. In, uh, I mean, good in a relative sense, of course, because anthropological data is, is always, um, uh, you know, subject to various, uh, you know, concerns. Mm-hmm. Um, there's very good anthropological data on the boundaries of African tribes prior to colonization, so pre-colonial African tribal boundaries, which uh, economists have been making use of, for example. So. Uh, yeah, you know, I think uh, I think uh, African data, while it isn't the best data to work with, 
for an economic historian, it's still, uh, you know, very, very good, you know, for uh, what it is. Uh, where, where do you see this research program on the economics of violence going in the future? There's one thing that we need to figure out, I think. Actually, there's two things. First of all, I think we need more evidence on mechanisms, more good evidence on mechanisms. You know, uh, we we observe a shock. There's violence. So what? You know, what's how does that shock transmit to the violence? What's the mechanism? That's what we need evidence on. We need a lot more evidence on that. Once we have a lot of evidence on that, we can start to construct uh, very good theoretical models of violence in a particular time, violence in a particular context, why violence manifests in the way it does. Um, I also think that you know now there's uh, a trend in economics to link the past to the present. You uh, cited the Ajimoglu Johnson Robinson study on settler mortality and institutions today. And I think that's all very good research. But what we really need to understand with that kind of research, even for the violence, is, you know, let's say a violent event happened uh, 500 years ago uh, and where we, you know, observe that that violent event has effects on democracy today. What we really need to find, what we really need is some good theoretical knowledge of when historical events, when historical institutions persist and when they don't persist. Because it's very easy, I think, to say, oh, you know, this persists. Um, Look at how significant my results are. What we really need is knowledge of when uh, a particular event, particular historical episode does and doesn't persist. Uh, And that's uh, going to be really key to the future of, uh, of this particular field. Yeah, there there are some visible institutions I can think of that have not persisted. For instance, the you know the Soviet Union collapsed mm-hmm. you know, twenty five years ago now. But nonetheless, you look at Russia today with uh, Putin as strongman, uh, basically running it autocratically, and you see some of the same patterns. So. Maybe communism itself was not a persistent uh, institution, but some elements of it have have persisted. Well, that's quite interesting that you mentioned that because there's a very good paper on, uh, I I, I forget the name of the paper now, so pardon me, but there's a very good paper and it's very fresh in my memory now uh, that you mentioned this. There's a paper on the division of East and West Germany into, uh, you know, East uh, Germany was under the uh, communists and West Germany, of course, was a liberal uh, free market, I guess, you know, quote unquote, free market uh, economy. Uh, It was a capitalist country, in other words. And so what this paper does is it uses the fact that prior to uh, the separation, there was this Germany was a unified country. Then what happens is the separation post World War Two, then around 1989, 1990, uh, they bec- it becomes one country again. German reunification happens. And what this paper does is it uses German, uh, um, I believe it's German questionnaires, German surveys on uh, opinions on, on the way people feel, for example, towards the state. What do people accept the state? What do people ec- um, expect the state to do for them? What expectations do East Germans versus West Germans have towards the state. And what they found is that people who were living in East Germany during the time of the communists, they find that people who are living in East Germany during that time uh, have much more expectations of what the state should be providing to them. You know, the state should be providing a job. The state should be providing this and that uh, as compared to West Germans, uh, which is quite an interesting finding, I think, and, and kind of mirrors what you're saying. Yeah, East and West Germany are a good case study because they provide a sort of natural experiment the same way North and South Korea do. I remember I visited exactly. I visited the Czech Republic and noted that all the the business leaders. Somebody pointed out to me that all the business leaders were the people who were just a little bit too young to have had their formative years under communism, and so could you know, prepare for a life under capitalism. If you were, if you were already 
said in your career uh, when the Berlin Wall came down and communism fell and the Czech Republic uh, reverted to capitalism, then you those people had a lot of difficulty transitioning and so the 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 leaders and the and the the business leaders and the visionaries all were all the people who were you know just just coming of age at that time and deciding their futures i like i like that because because that's you know also what this paper finds is that east germans who are younger kind of have less of that attitude towards the state so that that would seem to suggest that uh the, at least the attitudes don't persist beyond the genera- the generation they're in. Oh, um, there is still an attitudinal uh, divergence between young East Germans and uh, young West Germans. But the point the authors are making is that it's converging together towards, uh, I guess, a natural equilibrium. That you, So, yeah, eventually the persistence will decline, uh, you know, within uh, a few decades or a few uh, generations, I guess. So the mechanism of people have a certain attitude towards the state or towards a given institution, and so that institution, so that institution sticks around, doesn't really help us to say that why some institutions seem to persist for centuries. Exactly. And, yeah, and we really need a better theoretical understanding of, of why or why not that is the case. Why is North Korea the sort of last remaining communist state and how will it persist for you know into the 22nd century or or will it uh, collapse next week who knows exactly so what what other work are you are you working on now well i completed a paper on witchcraft trials in scotland and uh you know scottish witchcraft trial data i believe is among the best in you know, in the world, the witchcraft trials, they didn't happen during the medieval era. They happened in the early modern era, you know, around the 16th to 18th centuries. And what I do with this data is basically, uh, you know, uh, some very good researchers at the University of Edinburgh, including Julian Gadare, have digitized this data. They've posted it online. So I took this data, I matched it with temperature data from that period, uh, which some uh, scientists in Europe, Gio and Corona, I believe it was, um, have managed to extract from various sources. And so I matched the temperature data, I matched the witchcraft data, and I found a surprising result. I found that favorable shocks to to temperature lead to more witchcraft trials. In other words, when you have good weather, when you have good crop yields, you're going to have more witchcraft trials. So I was scratching my head at this result for a bit because it doesn't seem to fit with standard economic theories of violence. You know, you generally, when you have a strain on the economy, you're going to be more uh, inclined towards violence. Of course, you know, that um, isn't true with the rapacity effect, but you can't really observe a rapacity effect here. Could you define that rapacity? Oh, yes. So, so a rapacity effect is something like in Colombia, what happens when there's an oil shock. When there's an oil shock, when, there's a, uh, you know, when oil prices go up, then what guerrilla groups say to themselves is, ah, the value of kidnapping an oil executive goes up now, too. So when there's a beneficial shock to oil, kidnappings of oil executives increase in Colombia. And that was a paper by Dubé and Vargas. Uh, 2013 in, I believe it was economic studies. Anyway, um, so I couldn't observe anything like really similar here. So I I looked into the historical literature and I read a lot and I realized that actually witchcraft trials were very, very, you know, contrary to popular belief, the early modern Scots took these trials very, very seriously from a legal perspective and from a financial perspective too. Um, So you couldn't just arbitrarily try somebody as a witch. First, somebody had to go to their local uh, sheriff or local uh, laird or local, you know, um, person who was responsible for this and say, hey, you know, I think my my neighbor is a witch. Uh, Then what this person would have to do is send an emissary to Edinburgh to appeal to either the Privy Council or the Parliament uh, asking for permission to try this particular witch. They'd have to provide the evidence and, 
you know, they'd have to say in Edinburgh, hey, can we try this person as a witch? That is quite expensive in early modern Scotland, especially for some communities like, you know, if you are living in Shetland or the Outer Hebrides, it's very, very expensive to try a person as a witch. It's very costly. And then you had to go back and then you actually had to engage in the trial. You had to pay the executioner. Executioners were paid uh, for a single uh, for a single um, execution, rather, were paid quite a lot of money. Um, and uh, I calculated it somewhere. I can't find the numbers, but executioners were paid a substantial sum of money in those days. So the point is that witchcraft trials were very expensive to carry out. Uh, people were very interested in proper legal procedures for these trials. Uh, and so when you have beneficial temperatures, you have more income to actually try these people as witches. So in the in the example of the the South, there's actually there's a real economic sort of uh, competition between the the black farmers and the white farmers. And so they, you know, they, the lynchings have this sort of benefit of raising your wages if you're if you're not the ones being lynched. But in this case, trying witches was something that they always wanted to do. And I guess you're saying it's sort of a luxury good. I suppose you could think of it like that. Um, yeah, I suppose you could think of it like that. I mean, basically, it's something that you need the money to be able to do because they were quite invested in making sure that proper judicial procedure was carried out, which which is quite which is quite interesting to me. You know, when I was reading about these trials across Europe, my perception, my false perception was that these were kind of like lynchings in a way. Right. You know, you just find a, a woman who you think is a witch and you have a quick mock trial and then you you burn her or you hang her or you do something to her. But actually, the early modern people, you know, this was an era where we're starting to approach the age of enlightenment. We're starting to approach the age of reason, uh, but we're not quite at the age of empiricism yet. And so, you know, you, they were very invested in making sure that these trials were carried out using proper procedure, that witnesses were called, that they had evidence from somebody called a witch pricker in some cases, and so, you know, and, and that also that the witch made a confession, you know, witches' confessions were prized heavily during these trials. And it took sometimes torture through the form of sleep deprivation to be able to elicit a confession from a witch. So, uh, yeah, they had to have the resources in a particularly poor society like Scotland was at the time in order to be able to afford this, you know, leisure and this outcome of trying a witch trying a witch i'm reminded of monty python and so if she weighs more than a duck she's a witch yeah i love that scene that's a great scene actually yeah i remember i think i think my my first year logic professor showed us that scene in logic course so it was very funny yeah and it, it it's one of those examples of an argument that does not hold <laughs> exactly yeah. exactly <laughs> yeah <laughs> So I, I guess the uh, since we have con seemingly contradictory results, we have wi witches, witch trials that respond to good times and lynchings and political violence that respond to bad times. Is there sort of a, a common thread in all this? Yeah, and that common tre thread is that the context matters and the particular history matters for the particular result that you're looking at. You're right. The results are seemingly contradictory. In the case of lynchings, it's an unfavorable shock that results in violence. In the case of witchcraft trials, it's a favorable shock that results in violence. So the point is that the effects can be different in different institutional, uh, contextual, and different historical settings. And as economists, we have to be able to understand not only the models and not only the uh, empirical results, but we also have to understand the under uh, the underlying institutions and the underlying history and the underlying context behind a particularly act of uh, violence that we're studying. My guest today has been Cornelius Christian. Cornelius, thanks for being on Economics Detective Radio. Thanks so much, Garrett. That was really fun. <laughs> <laughs>
I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Economics Detective. If you want to support the show, you can go to economicsdetective.com slash support, where there's a link to my Patreon page. Patreon is a service that allows you to offer recurring donations, in this case per episode. Special thanks to my newest Patreon supporter, Nick. Nick and all my other supporters there get special access to my, what I call my afterthoughts episodes. It's after I've recorded and edited the episode, I take about 15 minutes to just talk about the themes in it and and discuss anything that sort of came up to me. Uh, I think they're really great, and I really like your support. So thanks, Nick, and thanks, everyone. If you're listening to this in a web browser, maybe you click through to it on economicsdetective.com, I encourage you to also subscribe via iTunes or Stitcher or whatever your favorite podcatcher is. That way you can get updated when there's a new episode out and listen to it right in your phone, have it download automatically. It's the way I listen to podcasts, and it really is the most convenient way to access the show. So go ahead and go to iTunes or Stitcher. There are links at economicsdetective.com. Thanks. Thanks.